Hello and welcome to the Middle East Forum speaker webinar series and podcast. I'm Stacey Roman and I will be moderating this discussion today. As our guest was unavailable for a live webinar, Richard Goldberg, a senior advisor for the Foundation for the Defense of Democracies, joined me earlier to discuss the new worst deal in history. Mr. Goldberg will speak for 15 minutes and open it up for questions or answer questions. As this is a pre recorded webinar, we will not be taking questions from the audience today. And with that, I will play the recording of my discussion with Mr. Richard Goldberg. Well, thank you so much for having me. Uh, a very important time, very timely discussion right now as we are starting to get more and more reports out of Vienna where indirect talks between the United States and Iran have been going on for many months. Uh, but now it appears uh, with an administration increasingly desperate to get any deal it can, uh, there will be some sort of an agreement uh, likely to emerge unless at the last minute uh, Iran walks away from the table. Unlikely so, since uh, all reports we've seen so far is that Iran's getting everything it's asking for, sanctions being lifted comprehensively, and the potential to retain much of the nuclear gains uh, that they have already advanced over the last year. Uh, since President Biden took office. There's going to be three key messages you're going to start to hear from the White House uh, in coming days. And I think it's going to be very important for people to understand why those messages are very misleading at best. Number one, the JCPOA, the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, the formal name for the Iran deal, the JCPOA was working. It was working when President Trump left the deal in 2018. We need to get back to that deal or something like it, uh, because we know it's the only way to avoid either a war in the Middle East or a nuclear armed Iran. That's a false statement, we'll talk about why. The second thing you're gonna hear is maximum pressure failed. The decision to abandon the deal back in 2018 uh, and to impose maximum pressure on Iran failed. What we are seeing today in Iran, they say, is because of maximum pressure, it's because of leaving the deal. And we need to go back to the deal as a result. Maximum pressure failed, false statement. We'll talk about why. And the third thing you may start seeing, we're seeing a little bit of this in the tea leaves from the press reports, is that this is just a pathway back to the JCPOA. This is not a new agreement. It's not a worse agreement. It's just going back to JCPOA, maybe with a few amendments here and there. That's something you're gonna hear. It's also false, and we'll talk about why. The JCPOA was not working. Let's start from the very beginning. There is a reason why there was bipartisan opposition to the Iran nuclear deal when Congress considered it in 2015. There is a reason why it was never submitted to the US Senate as a treaty for ratification, because President Obama knew it could never get the votes required to pass and ratify this deal as a treaty. What did the deal do? Remember, it gave Iran the ability to keep all of the illicit nuclear infrastructure it had built up first clandestinely and then an open view of the world for many years, keep that infrastructure in place to be able to use it at any time of its choosing to extort the international community. We had before the Iran deal an international consensus that Iran should not be allowed to enrich uranium on its own soil. We don't allow that for other countries. When we have nuclear cooperation agreements with a country like the UAE, for example, we don't allow enrichment uh, on someone's soil. We have something called the gold standard for civil nuclear power to ensure that there can't be any diversion. There can't be a proliferation threats that come with enrichment uh, on someone's soil. Uh, and what we have seen, obviously, is this oil-rich nation claiming that they want a civil nuclear program only after we had found and discovered and let the world know about their clandestine nuclear weapons program. The sites they use today were not something that we knew about just 20 years ago. The first site at Natanz unveiled just, just around 20 years ago from dissident groups. And then a few years later, Fordo, the underground mountain facility in 2009, revealed to the world as well. And what else have we learned since 2015? We learned that there was a secret nuclear weapons archive, that Iran was hiding from negotiators throughout its time negotiating the nuclear deal and implementing it. 
Not only that, but we've now learned in recent years from the IAEA, the International Atomic Energy Agency in Vienna, that that archive has apparently led them to undeclared nuclear sites where they have taken environmental samples, which have come back positive for nuclear material, undeclared nuclear material that is still not accounted for. We've seen satellite photos over the last couple of years of containers and material at a site that apparently later tested positive for nuclear material when the IAEA was finally allowed to go there. That site had been sanitized. The material, the containers moved. We don't know where any of that is today. This is an active, open investigation by the IAEA into Iran's undeclared, undeclared nuclear activities inside Iran today. We also know that the deal didn't cover most other things. It didn't cover Iran's sponsorship of terrorism. It didn't stop Iran from developing and testing longer range ballistic and cruise missiles that are capable of carrying nuclear weapons. It didn't force Iran to withdraw its forces uh, from throughout the region. We think about the IRGC's presence in Syria, in Yemen, their support to Hezbollah in southern Lebanon, what they're doing with Hamas and Palestinian Islamic Jihad in Gaza. None of this addressed. U.S. hostages, the money owed to U.S. victims of terrorism, not addressed. The list goes on of all these malign activities, and of course, one of the worst human rights abusers in the world, and one of the largest sponsors of anti-Semitism in the world in the Islamic Republic of Iran. None of that addressed in the deal. So what did Iran get in return for being able to keep all the capabilities to one day continue to pursue a nuclear weapon and not have any other of its malign activities checked and apparently be able to still conceal all of its undeclared nuclear work? Billions and billions and billions of dollars which, surprise, they took and poured into their terror activities, their regional activities, their meddling in other countries, their missile program, and of course, continuing to advance R&D on advanced centrifuges, which we are now seeing deployed today in their nuclear program going forward. Okay, so JCPOA was not working. It did not cut off Iran's path to nuclear weapons. It actually legitimized them. Not only did it allow them to retain all these capabilities, the deal even came with sunsets, remember, these sunsets. Sunsets that started kicking in in 2020. The U UN Security Council voted that if Iran just kept to this terrible deal, the UN arms embargo on Iran would lift in 2020. The UN missile embargo on Iran would lift in 2023, next year. And then all these other nuclear restrictions would fall away starting in 2023 on advanced centrifuges, uh, on enrichment until you get to 2031, and Iran's allowed to enrich uranium up to weapons grade under the deal. Totally crazy. It's a path to a military conflict or, in fact, a nuclear armed Iran, something we couldn't go back to. And we flash forward to these many years later, that deal, those sunsets are still in effect with the UN Security Council. So even going back to that deal wouldn't make a lot of sense. The sunset provisions are already in the rearview mirror. The arms embargo supposedly lifted in 2020. The missile embargo next year. All these other nuclear restrictions that would allow Iran to do exactly what it's doing today, only with the full legitimacy of international law, start coming into effect next year as well. It's completely ludicrous. And on top of that, to pay them billions and billions of dollars for it? Maximum pressure was working. Don't let them say otherwise. We know that coming into 2021, the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, reported that Iran was down to $4 billion in accessible foreign exchange reserves. At the IAEA, there was the active investigation into its undeclared nuclear activities, and Iran had already been censured once by the Board of Governors of the IAEA. They were up against a wall facing a potential non-compliance finding for their safeguards agreement and the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. And there was a push to snap back UN sanctions. US tried to do it, others objected, but it did look as though on the current trajectory of Iran escalating its nuclear program and not cooperating with the IAEA, that other countries like Great Britain would have to come forward and say, yes, it is time to snap back all the UN sanctions. There was also strong military deterrence in effect. Qasem Soleimani, dead. Mohsen Fakhrizadeh, the head chief architect of their nuclear weapons program, dead. The regime was a little shaken up. 
to, to have a little bit of an understatement. Faced with this economic pressure, faced with the political pressure, faced with military deterrence, maximum pressure was absolutely working. We have not been using maximum pressure for over a year now. When somebody says, everything you see today is a result of maximum pressure, maybe that would have made sense on January 20th or January 21st of 2021. We are now in February, almost March of 2022. President Biden stopped maximum pressure at noon on January 20th, 2021, and moved into what I like to call maximum deference, where we pulled back on economic pressure. We stopped enforcing our sanctions. We actually issued waivers out of the Treasury and State Departments to allow Iran access to its frozen funds. We stopped responding when Iranian proxies in the Middle East were targeting U.S. forces on an almost daily basis with drones and missiles. A contractor was killed in Western Iraq in March of last year, no military response whatsoever. Escalation against our allies, Saudi Arabia, UAE, Israel, maritime traffic, no response. At the IAEA, we pulled back on the investigation into undeclared nuclear materials. As Iran escalated its nuclear program and wouldn't comply, this administration told its diplomats in Vienna and pressured our European allies, amazingly stronger on this issue at the time than us, to not move forward with any censure resolutions. Don't provoke Iran, they said. They did that in March, in June, in September, and again in November of last year. And what did Iran do in response? It escalated its nuclear program far more severely under maximum deference than it did under maximum pressure. First going to 20% enriched uranium, then 60% enriched uranium, threatening to go to weapons grade enriched uranium, producing uranium metal, key component of nuclear weapons, limiting IAEA access to key facilities, withholding videotapes from those facilities, harassing IAEA inspectors, and of course, increasing their attacks throughout the region. So if anybody says that maximum pressure failed, well, on the record is absolutely the opposite. Maximum pressure was working. Maximum deference has led us to this point today. Finally, this is not a new deal, this is going back to the old deal. That's not true. Even if you assume that you were going back to an old deal, the old deal has already shifted. The old deal had sunsets at five years, at seven years and beyond. If you go back now to that deal, the sunsets are already much shorter. But that's not actually what they're doing. What they have negotiated in Vienna, according to news reports, is to give Iran more sanctions relief than they got under the JCPOA, and allow Iran to retain more nuclear capabilities than they were allowed under the JCPOA. It is in fact now the new worst deal in history. What does that mean? All thousands of sanctions on individuals, on companies, on banks, on sectors of Iran's economy didn't exist before the JCPOA. They were imposed in 2018, 2019, 2020. Those are now on the table to be lifted as part of the deal in Vienna terrorism sanctions and missile sanctions that were never imposed on Iran prior to the deal are now in place. We have terrorism sanctions, not nuclear sanctions, terrorism sanctions on the Central Bank of Iran, the National Iranian Oil Company, its tanker company, its petrochemical company, and 300 other entities. Many of those, if not all of those, are on the table to be lifted with money flowing directly to the IRGC through that financing channel. We were told by Barack Obama back in 2015, we're allowed to impose terrorism and missile sanctions under the JCPOA. Why now are we being told we're not? Why are we lifting terrorism and missile sanctions that were ordered by Congress on a bipartisan basis in 2017, even when we were in the JCPOA? That's because this is a new deal. We are giving Iran more sanctions relief to do more harm to our national security than we even gave them in 2015. On the flip side, we're hearing reports that because of the advances in Iran's nuclear program over the last couple of years, the breakout timeline, that's the time it would take Iran to produce enough enriched uranium at weapons grade levels that it would need to produce one nuclear weapon, that the breakout timeline for Iran will shrink under this deal than it was in 2015. They claimed in 2015 it would be a one-year breakout timeline for Iran under the uh, commitments that Iran had made. Of course, commitments they could break at any time, as we saw, but under those commitments. 
this now will shrink down perhaps to six months, maybe less. Why is that? How is that possible? It's because they have already gained a lot of knowledge. They have built and deployed advanced centrifuges. And the likelihood, we'll have to wait to see the details, is that they will not be required to dismantle everything they have built and deployed. They will retain those capabilities, meaning they can move faster towards a nuclear weapon at any time of their choosing in the future. Which means we are heading to a worse deal that gives Iran more money for less concessions and a greater ability to threaten us in the future at any time. If you wanted to know what will trigger a war in the Middle East or a nuclear Iran, it is the deal that's coming. And there are a lot of ways that Congress, state governments, and other actors will be able to fight back and try to stop this deal or at least deter the private sector from enriching Iran while sanctions are lifted until a new Congress or a new White House can reverse this policy. But bad news is we are heading in a very bad direction. The good news is there are tools for Congress and others to pursue. And I'm happy to talk about them in questions. Thanks so much. All right, thank you so much. So the first question we have is the administration has claimed that many of the terrorism sanctions imposed during the Trump administration were imposed illegitimately and contradict the JCPOA. How do you respond to that? Yeah, the, uh, it's, a, it's a completely ludicrous argument. Uh, and frankly, when the administration tried to trot that out last summer, reporters started calling them out on it and they had to walk those statements back. You saw Rob Malley, the special envoy for Iran, uh, try to call sanctions imposed on the central bank of Iran, the oil company and others for terrorism to be illegitimate, that they were inappropriately applied for political reasons to make it harder to go back to the JCPOA. What myself, many former officials, people who are in and out of government, not just Republicans, but Democrats as well, have said very publicly is that to get a terrorism sanctions designation through the US government, you have to have a solid evidentiary package that is reviewed by the State Department, by the Treasury Department, and the Department of Justice, along with the intelligence community, declassifying any intelligence that we need to be able to prove the case, and ensure that we can, in fact, put that forward to the public and say, here is the evidence that this institution is financing terrorism, which is why we are allowed to use our authorities under terrorism uh, to cut off uh, the flow of finances to that institution globally. To say now, after the Obama administration had made clear we are allowed to impose terrorism sanctions during the JCPOA, that these were imposed inappropriately is outrageous. And frankly, there's no precedent for what's about to happen. There is no precedent for the delisting of terrorism sanctions with no basis from the conduct of those entities. This will be a political decision to remove terrorism sanctions while those entities continue to finance terrorism. And that's something the private sector is gonna to have to really swallow hard on and think about uh, as sanctions get lifted. Thank you. Uh, the next question is, supporters of the JCPOA say the nuclear archive and the investigation of the IAEA today is about things that happened in the past, not the present. What's the response to that? Yeah, the safeguards agreement uh, that most countries have with the IAEA called the Comprehensive Safeguards Agreement and the NPT uh, therefrom require countries, parties to the NPT, signatories to the Comprehensive Safeguards Agreement to declare nuclear materials uh, to the IAEA. And so if you were working on something 10 years ago or you were working on something today, it is an active violation of the NPT to keep what you were working on, to keep your nuclear material secret from the IAEA, to not declare it. So the idea that this is a past indiscretion, not a current problem, is first of all false on a legal basis. This is an active problem for Iran. They are actively in violation of the NPT by failing to declare. But it's not just about what happened in the past. It is about what's going on today. People like to say that the JCPOA was historic levels of inspections. We're able to fully verify Iran's nuclear program, make sure it's, it's not used for illicit purposes, 
make sure they're not moving forward towards any nuclear weapons work. But the fact is, is that the IAEA throughout the JCPOA has never been able to certify that they know whether or not Iran is working towards a nuclear weapon. It's in every single report. The verification of the JCPOA, as we've seen, is incomplete because we've never forced Iran to fully account for any of its past and present activities. You know, this is sort of a, a maze and you have to follow all the breadcrumbs to actually find out where Iran is today in its progress towards nuclear weapons. And if you say, oh, well, this nuclear weapons archive, these sites, let's forget about them. Let's not worry about them. We'll just worry about what we can see today. That means that you are completely losing the trail on where they're going in their nuclear weapons work and program. You are not able to verify their program. You don't know what else they are hiding. And because of that, which is the way Iran wants it, they will continue to advance in whatever clandestine work they're going for alongside what the JCPOA or this new deal gives them to one day be able to very confidently break out to nuclear weapons capability. So to follow up on that, the IAEA has proven that they're undeclared nuclear sites. Uh, how is Iran getting away with that? Uh, it, it is unbelievable. It is unbelievable. Um, we actually have, for the first time in a while, a director general at the IAEA uh, who is willing to really press this issue hard. He was a skeptic of the JCPOA, Rafael Grossi of Argentina. And uh, there was a very big contested election for who would replace the former director general, Amano, uh, who very sadly died while in office. Uh, and the U.S. threw its support behind Grossi, and Grossi won. It wasn't just because of Iran. It was because we had confidence in his willingness to be an independent leader of the agency and take on challenges in the face of China or Russia or rogue regimes. And he has very forcefully come out in his statements throughout the last year when they meet quarterly at the Board of Governors. And, you know, Vienna has a very special diplomatic tone. They usually speak in code, very subdued language that you have to really read with a, with a decoder ring to understand somebody is, is saying something is wrong going on. There's no decoder ring needed for what Rafael Grossi is telling us publicly every quarter. There is a massive violation of the nuclear non-proliferation treaty going on in Iran today. And he believes it is a massive threat to the global non-proliferation regime that we are not doing anything about it. However, he is one person. He works for the Board of Governors. The Board of Governors is the body that has to find Iran in non-compliance, is the body that has to refer Iran to the Security Council for sanctions. And if you don't have American leadership willing to push the board in that direction, willing to introduce a resolution, if you pull back US allies from doing so, then Iran goes off and it gets away with it. And that's what's happening. Thank you so much for that explanation. Uh, the next question, the administration claims the deal they're negotiating would extend Iran's breakout timeline from just a matter of weeks to six to eight months or more. Does that make a deal worth it? It does not, uh, and, and I'll tell you why. What we have seen over the last couple of years proves the case of why it is a colossal failure of a deal to let Iran keep its capabilities intact. The idea that there are restrictions on Iran is an abstract restriction concept. There is only a restriction on Iran in so much as Iran decides, I'm going to hold by this deal today and not go into the closet and take out these centrifuges. I'm not gonna go reinstall these centrifuges in Fordo. I'm not gonna just decide today I'm gonna to enrich to 60% or 90%. You are completely dependent on the goodwill of the world's leading state sponsor of terrorism with a radical ideology that, which is to destroy the United States of America, the great Satan and Israel, the little Satan. So allowing them to retain all of these advanced capabilities as well and say, listen, the deal's working. We have a six month, eight month breakout time now is really just be, being an ostrich with national security, putting your head in the sand and make believing that you have restrictions on Iran in place. You have no restrictions on Iran in place. 
If the money runs out, if they ask for a higher price, they get to extort you anytime they want. And when one day they decide they have enough money and enough confidence that you're not going to do anything about it, they will make the move to nuclear weapons because that's what they ultimately want. So I think we need to be very clear eyed and put away these ideas of breakout timeline that really try to distract you in the conversation because ultimately you're still facing down either a war or a nuclear armed Iran. It just is a matter of Iran's choosing. Thank you. And uh, speaking of a war, we we know that Israel will probably go to war if Iran were to to have nuclear capabilities. Do you think the United States would support despite uh, their involvement with the JCPOA here? I think there would be strong support in Congress uh, for Israeli military action that it believes it needs to take uh, to defend its own security. Um, this is a, something that the United States should be leading on with our allies. Uh, Iran is not a threat to Israel. Iran is a threat to the world. Iran is a threat to the United States of America. Iran is developing longer and longer range nuclear capable missiles. They intend on developing an intercontinental ballistic missile capable of carrying a nuclear weapon to the continental United States. Now remember, this is a regime that pledges death to America. We are the great Satan, not Israel. They are the greatest sponsor of terrorism in the world. 1,200 uh, Gold Star families recently wrote to President Biden and said, please don't release funds to this regime. Certainly not until that money is used to pay our families, the federal judgments were owed because of our loved ones who were killed at the hand of Iranian terrorism. So let's be very clear eyed about the kind of regime we're dealing with, who they're a threat to, how they're a threat, and make sure we act accordingly here in the United States. But if Israel, our ally, decides that they need to do the dirty work of the world, that they're going to act to protect us all, then we need to support them if they take that action and make sure they're defended from any retaliation. Absolutely. It's amazing how disconnected we seem to be on that point. Uh, so finally, what are the alternatives to making this deal? Well, what we could do is reconstitute a multilateral campaign of pressure on the Islamic Republic of Iran. Uh, what we could do is say to our allies, enough is enough. We need to complete the snapback of UN sanctions, take away the sunsets, right? We are about to go ahead and give Iran more for less, but keep all the sunsets still in place. Those sunsets should go away and that should start with the snapback of UN sanctions. Then reimpose and enforce all US sanctions, ask our allies to do the same and put Iran to the choice, which is, do you want to face economic collapse? Do you wanna face the might of the US military, which we are willing to use as a last resort? Uh, are you going to finally come clean or else be held in violation of the NPT at the Security Council, referred by the IAEA, if you don't come clean on your undeclared nuclear activities? Really put this regime in a, in a box, a true box that they can't get out of. This White House will call this new deal putting Iran's nuclear program in a box. It is a box if you believe a box is something that has no ceiling and no sides. Uh, what we do need to do is actually put this regime in a box. Now, I'll say one last point before we end. Congress should do three things. One, defend its prerogative of oversight. This deal must be submitted to the Congress under the Iran Nuclear Agreement Review Act. This administration will claim it is the same deal as 2015 and try not to submit it. It is not the same deal. They would be violating the law if they don't submit it. This would be a completely illegitimate agreement. Defend terrorism sanctions. This will be a completely illegitimate agreement if the United States lifts terrorism sanctions without any change in Iran's sponsorship of terrorism. Don't let them do that. Push legislation to reimpose all sanctions tied to terrorism. And finally, defend the Nuclear Nonproliferation Treaty. Giving Iran any money and legitimizing its nuclear program during an active investigation into undeclared nuclear activities is the height of insanity. Make sure that we try to reimpose U.S. sanctions if Iran does not come clean on its secret nuclear work. All right. Well, thank you so much. Uh, before we go, can you tell our viewers where we can find some more of your work? Absolutely. You can follow me on Twitter at Rich underscore Goldberg and all of my writings at uh, FDD.org. All right. Thank you so much.
so much. Unfortunately, we've come to the close of our webinar. Thank you, Mr. Goldberg, for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. All right, and I hope you all enjoyed that program. Uh, for our viewers, please join us Wednesday at 3 p.m. Eastern for an update with Ashley Perry. Thank you all for joining us, and I hope you have a wonderful day.